So hello and welcome to the fifth lecture of this course which is entitled Gender and Literature. So today we'll take up an essay by George Orwell. It's called Shooting an Elephant. And we're going to look at how uh, gender, identity, power, these things play out in a political space. So this essay by uh, Orwell, Shooting an Elephant, is, an, is largely an autobiographical essay which was written by him when he was stationed in Burma as a police officer. So for a period of time in his life, he was a colonial uh, police officer working in Burma uh, for the empire. Uh, and then this particular essay is a reflection of his experiences. Uh, there are many things he wrote when he was in Burma. There's an entire series of essays he had written. There's a novel called Burmese States, which is a very fine work of literature, which if you're interested in uh, colonialism and the history of colonialism and the literature of colonialism, it's a very good read. I suggest. But this particular essay called Shooting an Elephant is a really rich essay, especially when it comes to looking at the relationship and identity, power, race, and of course gender. Uh, and most importantly, what we have to bear in mind when we are reading this essay is a setting, which the context which produced this essay, the historical context, which is obviously one of imperialism, British imperialism in Burma. So we start with this essay, Shooting an Elephant, by George Orwell. So uh, a large part of what I'll do today in this lecture is I'll take you through uh, this particular essay and obviously I'm going to link it, I'm going to connect it with a very different theoretical apparatus which we had been studying for the last uh, you know, two or three lectures. And if you remember the last uh, text which we covered was Shatran Sri Kilari by Munsi Premchad. And obviously we also looked at uh, certain references from the Shotia Dry film which was made out of the story. Uh, and obviously we looked at the story as a text uh, for gender studies and we looked at how uh, things like uh, gender, space, identity, uh, political situations, so agency, these things play out against each other uh, in certain discursive settings. So this essay too uh, is a very important uh, uh, text, especially if you're looking at the relationship between gender, identity uh, and how these things so inform each other but also uh, deconstruct in certain uh, sort of personal existential situations in a political space. No, so largely what we'll do today in this lecture is we'll look at you know, certain key issues which we have been touching upon uh, in almost everything we've done so far. So whether we're looking at Twelfth Night by William Shakespeare, whether we're looking at uh, you know, uh, uh, Shatran Sri Hilary, The Chess Place by Munshi Premcha, whether we're looking at gender and literature uh, in terms of a theoretical connection. These are some of the key issues we have been uh, talking about uh, in a very recursive kind of a way. So the key points in this particular lecture will be the following. Gender as performativity, that is racially and politically predetermined. Gender and power. Gender entitlement and agency. Gender and crisis and agency. So these things are important. I mean, these are the different issues which we've been looking at, uh, especially in our uh, you know, study of Orwell's essay, Shooting an Elephant. So first things first. The first point which is on the screen at the moment is gender as performativity that is racially and politically predetermined. So we've been talking about performativity, we've been talking about what is performativity, it's the kind of performance which is uh, designed to generate an effect as we have mentioned and we'll come back to the point, we'll have this definition played out on the screen in a, in a moment. But obviously uh, we had discussed it already. Uh, now in this particular essay what's important to understand is how this notion of performativity, this ontology of performativity is racially and politically predetermined. So not only is it something which you're doing as a person, but also you are extending a particular racial identity, you're extending a particular political identity. Uh, so in a performativity is sort of very complexly connected uh, in this particular essay as we'll see uh, when we read it with uh, the notions, the idea of race, racial identity and uh, the political identity and connected to all that is the question of agency which we'll come into in a moment. The second point, uh, gender and power. Uh, the obviously we've been talking about the relationship between gender and power especially when we looked at uh, Prem Chan's short story, Shatran Sri Kilari, we saw how uh, the males in the story, they, they have certain powers, political powers, financial powers, social powers, cultural powers, uh, precisely because or merely because they happen to be biologically men, males. And we saw the tragic situation of the woman uh, in the short story where despite being more intelligent, more intuitive, uh, you know, better skilled in administrative duties, they are relegated to, to a domestic space, they are relegated to the interior space uh, just because it happened to be a woman. So they don't really have any power, they don't really possess any power. 
So gender and power, uh, they're very complexly related to each other. Uh, historically, that's true. We, we, if you look at any, uh, you know, any history of humanity, you know, gender and power have always been very, very complexly related. So, you know, your gender determines your power. Your power determines a large part of what your gender identity is. The third point, uh, as I mentioned a little while ago, is the relationship between gender, entitlement, and agency. So, entitlement, as you know, is the automatic expectation of something just because you happen to be someone. So, you know, if you're a white person in a colonial space, you have certain entitlements, certain privileges. Uh, you know, certain expectations. And the question of expectation is very important in this particular essay because what we have in this essay is a series, is an economy of expectations which has to be lived up to by the white man, uh, by a particular gendered identity. So if you have a certain gendered identity, if you have a certain gendered uh, location, there is automatically an economy of expectation that builds around you, that is generated around you. And you know you you are supposed to live up to the expectation. You are supposed to live up to the narrative of the expectations. If you fail to live up to the narrative of the expectations, then we have a crisis. Then we have some kind of a problem. You know the entire relationship between gender and power and entitlement and agency. Uh, this entire relationship gets problematized when you fail to live up to the expectations around your gendered identity. So gender, entitlement, and agency. Uh, you know, three very crucial points which are heavily present in this particular essay as we'll study when we look at it. Uh, the final point that we'll look at, and obviously this is by no means an exhaustive list, there are many more things we'll look at uh, as we uh, study the essay, but I'm just giving you a summary, an indicative list uh, of things which we are sort of going to harp on as we read the essay in due course. The, the fourth point is agenda and crisis and agency. So if we connect this with the uh, second point with gender and power, uh, so power and agency, they're related to each other. So if you have power, you automatically assume certain agency. You are, you are allowed to do certain things. You have the freedom, in other words, uh, to enact your will, uh, to carry out what you want to do uh, and in order to make a change, etc. So you can uh, assert your agency, you can assert your authority to a certain extent uh, if you happen to have power. But you know, the relationship between gender and agency obviously is quite complex, as you saw in the previous lectures uh, on uh, Shatan Shikilari, that if you have a certain kind of gender, a certain gender, I mean, you happen to be a, a, a male in that kind of a social situation, a very feudal, pre-capitalist, uh, you know, uh, award where the story is set in uh, Munshi Premchand's Shatan Shikilari. So if you have that kind of a situation, then, you know, by just being a man, uh, and being a social person, a man, a social man, you happen to have certain kind of agency. And just by not being that as a woman, you have the lack of agency. So you suffer a crisis on agency just because you happen to be not a man in that kind of a social setting. Now, interestingly, what this particular essay does, and the reason why I find it uh, extremely complex and interesting as a very rich study of gender, uh, is it looks at how uh, being powerful being politically powerful, uh, being uh, racially powerful can also generate a crisis on agency. Now, this is important because it's very easy to understand how uh, being politically powerless, being racially you know, marginalized can cause a crisis on agency. It happens all the time that if you're a black person in a white dominated colonial space, then obviously you have less agency than your white male counterparts. And that's easy to understand. It's historically true. That's happened all the time. That's something which happens even now in certain social situations. However, the point I'm making is more complex. The point here in George Orwell's essay is precisely the opposite, you know, the ontological opposite. That you know, if we have a certain kind of gendered identity, if we have a certain kind of political and racial identity in colonial Burma, uh, then you automatically assume a certain degree of agency and authority. But the funny thing about this essay, and I use the word funny in a very loaded kind of a way, it's very dark, humorous uh, in, in, in several ways. Uh, the funny thing is, uh, this particular person in this essay, uh, which is obviously George Orwell himself, he suffers a crisis in agency precisely because he is powerful. And that's a bit of a paradox, right? Because you don't normally expect it. You expect a politically, racially, culturally powerful person to have an assert certain agency. You don't expect that person to suffer from a crisis in agency because of being, you know, because he is powerful. Right. You don't normally see that, but this particular essay uh, does and showcases and dramatizes exactly that. Right? The relationship between gender and crisis and agency. You have this hegemonic gender identity. You're a white man in a non-white colonial space. So you are basically the hegemonic gender identity. So you, you're very powerful. Ontologically, theoretically, you're very, very powerful. But then 
you know, something happens, uh, a certain narrative twist takes place, which basically reveals before you your powerlessness. And this particular powerlessness emerges out of your being powerful. So, it is a very paradoxical situation. It is a situation which is very complex and essentially, uh, you know, it has got a dark humorous uh, uh, component to it. But at the same time, it is a, re a revelation. You, know, you, you get to know that you are not really a powerful, despite assuming the authority, the signifier of power. You have the signifier of power, you have the image of power. You are a white man with a gun in a, in a colonial space, uh, surrounded by colonial natives, colonized natives. And despite all this, you do not really have any agency, you do not really have any particular, uh, you know, you, do, you can't really carry out your free will in certain situations and that is very important and that is something we will look at when we read this essay. So, uh, this is exactly what happens uh, in Orwell's essay uh, as you will find out when we read it in, uh, in details, we will play out certain sections of the text and we will look at it and, and try to unpack what he is trying to say uh, in that essay. But the point is how the compulsion to generate the performativity of powerful gender identity paradoxically produces an experience of powerlessness. So, it is a paradoxical production as I mentioned a little while ago. Uh, there is a compulsion to generate the performativity of powerful gender identity. So, you are, you are forced to carry out to enact or uh, perform the role of the powerful gender identity. So, in this particular case, you, the, the identity of a white man in a non-white space and that is the uh, performance, that is, that is the image you have to play out all the time, right and you are compelled to do it, you know you are forced to do it to a certain extent and that compulsion, you know the, the forced, you know the fact that you are forced to do it all the time, that paradoxically produces an experience of powerlessness. In other words, uh, to put it more bluntly, the fact that you have to be powerful all the time, that is what makes it powerless. The knowledge that you have to be appear powerful all the time, the knowledge that you have to uh, you know enact power all the time, because you belong to a certain gender uh, and obviously, uh, that particular gender is mediated also by race you know. So, if you are just a Burmese man in colonial Burma, you will not be so powerful, but if you are a British white person in colonial Burma, then obviously, you, you, you are very very powerful you know politically, uh, socially, culturally, linguistically, you are powerful in every sense of the word, right. But the fact is, you know, there is a difference between the human you and the powerful you. And this is exactly what I me meant when I uh, discuss embodiment with you. So, when I define, if you remember, when I define embodiment as a combination of neural mechanism as well as extended social mechanism, it is what you are inside, right. So, what you are as a person inside, what you are as a brain, as a consciousness, as a series of emotions, uh, as you know a neural self, a core self that is one component of embodiment. But equally the other important component of embodiment is to see how you enact that self in a social space, how you extend that self in a social space, right. So, this idea of enacting, extending uh, your neural self into certain social situations that constitutes embodiment. Right? So, that particular uh, tension between what you want to do uh, as a human being and what you have to do as a social person, uh, that, that is really interestingly dramatized in Orwell's essay, uh, Shooting an Elephant and we will look at it uh, in great details as we move on, especially uh, through the lenses of gender studies as we have mentioned so far. Uh, uh, the second point is how the white man's privilege in the colonial space converts into a knowledge of nothingness through an existential experience of self-questioning and ambivalence. So, the, the idea of ambivalence is very important over here. So, he is ambivalent about something, right and what is he ambivalent about? He is ambivalent about the fact that you know he is, he is in two minds. So, he sees a certain thing, he sees a certain image, uh, he wants to do something, but he knows uh, he is forced to do something else, right. And this, this entire uh, break between what he wants to do as a person and what he is forced to do as a, as a social self is what generates his ambivalence, right. And this ambivalence comes from the knowledge of nothingness that you know he suddenly realizes that despite being a powerful male, uh, you know racially powerful, politically powerful male in this colonial space, he actually is powerless. He actually becomes an image of nothingness, right. So, uh, from privilege to poverty and this is a very quick transition which happens in Orwell's essay. So, he starts off being this white man in a colonial space, so obviously he is very privileged, uh, racially privileged, politically privileged, but you know uh, certain things happen, certain events take place in the course of the essay as it is described 
and that that convinces them you know it, it really awakens them to the knowledge of its own nothingness and that's something we'll look at uh, as we look at the essay in some details so before we start with the essay uh, the points uh, just to reiterate what i've said so far this is a very political essay and that's something we need to be careful about this is written by a colonial officer working in colonial burma uh, so he is a colonial white british officer working in a non-white colonial burma and obviously he's talking about his experiences as a, as a as a colonial officer now obviously as i mentioned at a superficial level if you look at it superficially from the outside uh, he obviously assumes a position of authority, a position of uh, a great agency. You know, he is the, the image of power, the image of authority, uh, so to say. Uh, so he, he enjoys uh, a certain series of privileges uh, and that sort of comes to him automatically by default because he happens to be a white man with authority, with military authority, with police authority, etc. So uh, superficially speaking, he is in a pretty good condition, right, politically, uh, racially, in every sense of the word. But what makes the essay complex, what makes the entire situation complex is the sudden awakening uh, of his knowledge of nothingness. That he realizes that you know, uh, all this entire uh, materiality of power around him, uh, that includes race, that includes uh, language, that includes political power, etc. That entire materiality around him is basically a mutable construct. And I've used the word construct before, especially when talking about performativity. So gender is a construct. Uh, identity is a construct. It's something you construct through performances, through strategic performances. Hence, we use the word performativity, right? So it's a performative construct. It's something which is performatively produced, and hence it's a construct. And anything which is a construct can be deconstructed and reconstructed. In other words, what we're moving into very quickly now is the textuality of power, the textuality of gendered identity, especially in relation to power. So uh, I've mentioned this before uh, by the use. When I'm using the word textuality, or, or when I'm using the word text in general, I'm looking at a mutable construct, something which can be constructed and analyzed, and equally, something which can be uh, deconstructed and reconstructed. Right? So we're looking at the textuality of power, we're looking at the textuality of gender, we're looking at the textuality of gendered hegemonic identity in certain political situations. And that's the really interesting thing which we'll look at when we read Orwell in this particular essay called Shooting an Elephant. And obviously, the big question which happens, which comes up in the course of the essay, is a pull between two different orders of will. So one will is obviously the very core existential neural will, that he doesn't want to do a certain act. In this particular case, he doesn't want to shoot an elephant. right? But the other bigger, hegemonic, overarching will is the fact that he has to carry out this particular act, because that, that is what becomes his gendered political identity. In other words, because he happens to be a white male in a non-white colonial space, there's, certain, there's an economy of expectations around him, right? And he has to satisfy those expectations, right? Because those are the same expectations which inform his privilege, which inform his power, which inform his identity as a colonial officer in Burma, okay? So with this preamble, we sort of dive into the essay and we look at how, you know, uh, it plays out, especially in relation with you know, performativity, power, and gendered identity. But it's very quickly taking you through again, uh, through um, the definition of performativity, which I've played out a couple of times before. But just to reiterate, it's the performance that is designed to generate an effect and its corresponding iconic identity. Uh, so the word iconic is important over here. It's, it's got a larger than life, a representative image, a representative quality to it, right, which makes it really unique. So that particular performance can happen sometimes through a spectacle, and often through a spectacle. So it's spectacular. It's excessive, spectacular, dramatic. Uh, it's aiming to produce uh, uh, in a movie's consumer with a sense of awe, adulation, and reverence, and also fear sometimes, uh, and often a mixture of all three. So in other words, uh, it's a kind of a, a very strategic kind of an act, a very strategic act which is designed to generate uh, you know, certain kinds of political identities. You know, it can be used rhetorically, it can be used through the body, it can be used through dress, it can be used through a series of other material uh, you know, metaphors and markers. And when in this particular case, we are looking at you know, race, language, power, uh, and all these things sort of, you know, coalescing together in order to produce what we have uh, as an iconic identity. And that's obviously done through performativity. Okay? So this is something we've talked about before. And, uh, 
So in a nutshell, Owell's essay shows how the anxiety to be constantly performative, and that's an important phrase, constantly performative. So it's, it's a bit of an endless performance. You have to perform all the time as a person, right? So as a colonial officer, as a uh, as a colonial officer in Burma, you have to be performative all the time. You have to have certain kind of um, expectation around you. You have a certain kind of uh, privileges around you. In order to fulfill those privileges, you have to perform all the time. A certain kinds of acts. Now, the, the point is, you may not like to perform those acts all the time. You may not like to carry on those acts all the time. But that's beside the point. That's that's something which gets increasingly redundant. Your unwillingness to be performative becomes redundant. That becomes a new option. You know, it isn't an option anymore, right? And that is where the crisis of agency comes in. So this idea, this this desire, this anxiety to be constantly performative, it often comes at the cost of human agency. And so the the relationship between agency and power over here becomes very, very complex. It becomes really almost inverted. They are almost inversely proportional to each other. The more powerful you are, the less agency you have at a certain level. Okay? So thus, this particular essay dramatizes the division but in two different orders of embodiment, the artificially performative one and the natural organic one. So you know, we talked about embodiment as a bit of an interface between these two different kinds of orders. One is obviously the natural organic uh, corporeal neural order of embodiment, what we do through a brain, through a body, uh, through our nerves, etc. And the other is more complex, how we extend it into a social space, how we enact it, extend it, embody it uh, in social situations. And that's a bit of a prosthetic embodiment, if we, you know, uh, if you will. So it's artificial, it's performative, uh, and you know, the point is how do these two orders of embodiment uh, become dialogic with each other? The artificial, prosthetic, enacted order of embodiment and the uh, interiorized, inward looking, natural, organic order of embodiment. So, how do, how do these two uh, you know, enter into some kind of a dialogue with each other? What happens if one becomes stronger than the other? In this particular case, obviously, uh, the stronger order of embodiment is the artificial, performative one. Uh, and the natural, organic one becomes less important, it's relegated uh, into uh, redundancy. Okay, so, uh, and the other important thing which we should pay some attention to when we're looking at this essay is the idea of mimicry. Now, obviously, the word mimicry is a very loaded political term in uh, colonial and post-colonial studies. Those of you who are interested in colonial studies, uh, you know, most of you might be acquainted with this word. It's a familiar word. It's something which is used heavily in, you know, uh, academic parlance, especially in relation to colonial studies. Now, uh, in this particular case. The mimicry is of a different order. You know, the biological person, the human being, uh, George Orwell, he has to mimic the identity of the white man. There is a narrative out there which is pre-established before he had come to Burma, and a white man must behave in a particular way. So there is a series of uh, expectations around him, uh, you know, which are racially mediated, politically mediated culturally mediated, obviously, uh, linguistically mediated. Now, those expectations had formed the narrative even before it had come in. Now, his entire job uh, as a police officer in Burma, his entire uh, tension as a police officer in Burma is to constantly mimic that identity, right? to live up to it, in other words, uh, to, to be in such a way that corresponds to that kind of identity. So the, the point is, it, this entire essay shows how performativity and its corresponding mimicry, the white man uh, constantly living up to the I image of the iconic identity of the white man, creates nervous tension and existential exhaustion. So there is a very palpable uh, neurotic quality to this essay. And you know, obviously, this is an essay written much later. You know, it describes an experience which had happened many years ago. So the voice telling you the story uh, is a karma wiser, older voice telling you a story about something which happened many years ago. It's a bit like what happens in Great Expectations, an older pip telling the story of a younger pip. Uh, so a less neurotic voice telling you a story of a more neurotic self many years ago. But that, that neurotic quality is actually there, it's palpably present uh, in this particular essay. That tension, the neurotic tension, uh, it's still very, very much, you know, it's, it's something which is quite visible. Uh, in the terms uh, how the descriptions happen, how he describes the very claustrophobic uh, condition of colonialism, etc. And what this entire nervous tension does uh, in this essay is it creates an idea of this experience of existential exhaustion. So he feels completely exhausted existentially 
and why so? Because his entire existential will, desire, uh, his entire uh, existential fantasy, uh, agency, so all these things are relegated uh, into the background. And the only thing which is important, uh, which he has to perform all the time, is the iconic identity of the white man. So that is the most important thing. Right? The iconic identity of the white man and everything else can be secondary, tertiary uh, and then marginalized and you know, something which can be relegated. Right? But the, the entire discourse, the entire endeavor, the endless endeavor to constantly live up and produce and reproduce uh, ad infinitum the image of the white man in a non-white colonial space, that is what exhausts them existentially. That is what causes the, the existential exhaustion. Right? And obviously that makes them neurotic, that makes them guilty, that makes them disillusioned about the entire idea of power uh, and obviously that makes them cynical. So this is a very cynical kind of an essay about a very bitter old person uh, who had looked through colonialism uh, and seen what colonialism really is and now he's giving you uh, in a much wiser, calmer version of a very neurotic experience which happened to him when he was a younger police officer working in Burma. Okay. So, hopefully, uh, what we have right now uh, is uh, the entire entanglement uh, between uh, identity, uh, embodiment, racial identity and, and how all these things come together to produce the idea of gender. Right? And I use the word idea quite deliberately over here, the, the construct of gender, how gender is constructed, how certain gendered uh, identities are constructed uh, in this particular essay. Uh, obviously constructed as mediated through race, as mediated through um, you know, political conditions, colonial conditions, etc. Okay? So this is the backdrop of the essay, uh, Shooting an Elephant. And we now dive into the main essay, the main text. But hopefully uh, you have an idea of what the essay is all about. And mind you, this is written in the 1920s. Uh, the setting is 1920s, colonial Burma. So uh, it's a very politically incorrect essay. Uh, and that's what makes him so politically significant uh, to our times because it doesn't even try to be politically correct. So it tells you very clearly, as you find out in a moment when I play the next slide, it tells you very clearly that he, uh, he has an ideological aversion towards imperialism. He hates imperialism ideologically. He knows it's a bad thing uh, and he's sort of very guilty because he's a part of it. But equally, he hates the local Burmese people because they hate him. So he's not trying to be politically correct. He's not saying, oh, I am uh, in love with the Burmese people. He says, I'm in love with the Burmese cause. But that's a different thing. At, at a micro level, he really hates the Burmese people because they hate him. They make his life miserable because you know, he's a white man. They all have to you know, abide by him. They all have to you know, be afraid of him. They all have to, have to carry out his orders. But obviously, internally, they all hate him, as they should. Right? So he becomes less a human being and more an image. And that is what makes the essay quite complex. Right? So his entire gendered location uh, in this particular essay is a very complex political location. And that becomes a complete package. It's so artificial that it becomes something uh, outside of himself. Right? So his gendered identity as a white colonial man is so external to his internal, uh, to his organic identity as a human being. It, you know, the two are so separable that it almost becomes comic at a certain level. It almost becomes, you know, as if he has some kind of a uh, split personality. He wants to do something as a human being, but as a white colonial man, uh, as a white colonizer, he has to do something else. And who's going to win? There's a bit of a tussle, a tension going on between these two orders of embodiment. Uh, and the, the point is, who wins in the end? Uh, and we see quite clearly, it's the organic human order which loses. That becomes less important than the political uh, extended order of embodiment. Okay? So this is the, basically the long and short of the essay uh, in its theoretical premise. And now we move on uh, to what happens in shooting an elephant. So why is it an important essay uh, in uh, gender studies? Uh, and especially in relation to expectation, entitlement, agency, identity, performativity, mimicry. So all these very loaded terms which we've used so far. Uh, how do these terms come together to describe uh, a very human experience uh, in a colonial space? And that's what constitutes shooting an elephant by George Orwell. Right. So uh, we now move on uh, into the essay actually. We sort of dive in. And this is a very, uh, this is the opening of the essay which with, with which he describes his condition uh, and how we sort of stuck between two different orders of hatred. So uh, he hates the empire because he knows it's an evil thing, uh, but that's more of an ideological hatred, uh, a discursive hatred, uh, which happens at a level of ideas. 
Uh, and the other hatred is more micro, more visceral, more immediate, uh, where he says, I hate the Burmese people because they all hate me. Right? Uh, and you know, it's a bit of a very, you know, there's a lot of hatred around him, uh, and he finds it difficult to live there as a normal human being, and that's what makes him neurotic uh, increasingly. So, uh, as you say very clearly, uh, in moment in Lower Burma, I was hated by a large numbers of people. The only time in my life when that had been important enough uh, for this to happen to me. Now, you can see immediately the cynicism, uh, this of pseudo comic quality, the tragic comic quality coming in at the very opening of the essay. So, he was important enough uh, to be hated by uh, a lot of people. And that's something which happened only once in his life, you know, when he was in Burma, stationed as a colonial officer. I was subdivisional police officer of the town, and in an aimless, petty kind of way, anti European feeling was very bitter. So, you know, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand that there will be lots of anti European sentiments because the Europeans were there uh, as colonizers. Uh, they were the people exploiting the Burmese people, exploiting them financially, culturally, militarily. Uh, and so, you know, there was no great reason why the Burmese would like them. Uh, let alone accept them as their own. So there's a lot of anti-European sentiment uh, which he found himself in the middle of as a, a subdivision and police officer in town. No one had the guts to raise a riot, but if a European woman went through the bazaars alone, somebody would probably split beetle juice over her dress. Uh, this is important. So the European woman becomes oh yeah, uh, a bit of an easy target. Uh, because she is someone who is not as powerful as the European man, because she doesn't have the political power uh, except what is conferred to her by the male protector. If you read uh, over Burmese days, you'll find uh, that kind of a relationship is very uh, conspicuous, it's very visible. We have a woman called Elizabeth who comes in from England, uh, and she is, becomes uh, someone who is sought after by all the colonial officers, and the male officers, they all go after her. But the point is, she herself does not seem to have a lot of agency except what is given to her by the other white men around her. So the location of the European woman in a colonial space is quite complex because at some level, uh, she obviously at a superficial level is European, so racially she's superior to everyone else around her, etc. But she also happens to be a woman and we're talking about times where women didn't have anything in terms of political agency, in terms of financial agency. So they are very, still very, very heavily dependent on their uh, males around them. So the European woman walking through the bazaar becomes an easy target for the uh, Burmese people who would do what? Spit beetle juice all over a dress. As a police officer, I was an obvious target you know, and was baited whenever it seemed safe to do so. So as a police officer, he was more of an image of authority, so he was feared as well as hated equally, in equal measures. And that's something which is important. That, you know, because he's an image of authority, uh, there will be a lot of aversion towards him. People would hate him because he is someone who represents who, you know, that icon of uh, exploitation, you know, authority, power, domination, etc. But equally, he's someone who would be hated for precisely the same reasons. Right? People don't, would not, never like him because he happens to be a police officer. So when a nimble Burman tripped me up in a football field and the referee, another Burman, looked the other way, the crowd yelled with hideous laughter. So suppose uh, he's, he's talking about a sports game, a sports event where he's playing football with other Burmese people. Now, uh, a nimble Burman, someone in the field, uh, might trip him, uh, you know, foul him in a game of football, and the, the referee, who's another Burman, would look the other way, would not give a penalty, would not show a card, etc. And what that would do is that would generate uh, a great laughter among the Burmese spectators, you know, to see the white man uh, down on the ground, tripped by the Burmese people, etc. Uh, and that's something uh, which is a bit of a micro revenge. That's how they avenge themselves uh, of the exploitation that a white man had done to them. So, from the very beginning of the essay, we seem to have a certain kind of uh, narrative coming in. So, what is being told to you or us as readers is the fact that the human location in this narrative is not so important. But the racial macro location, you're just a white man. And because you're a white man, you are expected to be certain things. Because you're a white man, you're expected to behave in a particular way. Because you're a white man, you're expected to, to respond, receive certain kinds of emotional uh, you know, responses. So people will hate you, people will be afraid of you, uh, despite the fact that you might be a different kind of a white man. Okay? So the white man, uh, basically, the, I, the image of the white man, the icon of the white man, it basically consumes the, uh, the human being who happens to be the white person. 
in that setting. So George Orwell the man becomes increasingly less important compared to George Orwell the police officer. So this is a very good example of how gender performativity basically consumes biological, organic uh, identity and their associated agency. Okay? So, so the crowd would laugh whenever he would be tripped on the football field by another Burmese uh, person and the referee, the, another Burman would look the other way and the play would continue while you just get up uh, you know, full of mud. Uh, and that sight of the white man uh, down on the ground covered with mud is something which the Burmese would find very, very amusing and they would laugh uh, collectively. This happened more than once. In the end, the sneering yellow faces of young men that met me everywhere, the insults hooted after me when I was at a safe distance, got badly on my nerves. So you find, and I mentioned this a little while ago, this is an essay which does not want to be, which does not set out to be politically correct. So you know, if someone were writing it now, uh, sneering yellow faces of young men, you know, and if you're using that kind of an adjective uh, to talk about uh, you know, certain human beings, that would be considered immediately racist. But the point over here is, uh, you know, he's not trying to be politically correct. He's just giving you a very honest uh, description of his experiences as a white man in a colonial setting, as a police officer in that kind of a situation, right? So he'll find the people around him you know, sneering at him. Uh, you find it, you know, very, very uncomfortable, and he would describe them as yellow faces, right? But equally, he hates his own job, as you find out uh, a little later. So, you know, it just got badly on his nerves. The young Buddhist priests were the worst of all. There were several thousands of them in the town, and none of them seemed to have anything to do except stand on street corners and jeer at Europeans. Okay? Uh, so, you know, he, he is sort of looked at. There's this collective gaze at him right, as a white man. So wherever he goes, he realizes people are looking at him with hatred, with aversion, with fear. Uh, none of these are positive emotions. No one looks at him with love. Right? So the entire collective gaze that he experiences when he suffers as a colonial person, as a colonial officer in Burma, is a gaze of hatred. Right? And that begins to consume him, uh, that begins to make him more neurotic, that begins to make him more cynical, that begins to make him more bitter. Right? And this is what happens in the course of this essay. Right, so, uh, so it's not a happy situation to be in. It's a very neurotic situation to be in. He finds himself hated by everyone. He finds himself in the middle of power, uh, but you know, not really powerful because he just has to carry out the duties given to him. He just has to fulfill the, the expectations of being a white man in a colonial space. So he's not really free. And on top of that, he's hated by everyone around him. So it's not really a happy situation to be in, as this particular passage describes. All this was perplexing and upsetting. For at that time, I, ha I had already made up my mind that imperialism was an evil thing. And the sooner I chucked up my job and got out of it, the better. Theoretically, and secretly of course, I was all for the Burmese and all against the oppressors, the British. As for the job I was doing, I hated it more bitterly than I can perhaps make clear. In a job like this, you see the dirty work of empire at close quarters. The wretched prisoners huddling in the stinking cages of the lockups the grey, coward faces of the long-term convicts, the scarred buttocks of the men who had been flogged with bamboos. All this oppressed me with an intolerable sense of guilt, but I could get nothing into perspective." So it's a very depressing kind of a description, as you can see uh, from the very beginning. So he, he can see imperialism as a very bad thing. And uh, the text we'll do after this is Heart of Darkness. And you find a similar kind of situation coming in, a similar kind of ambivalence coming in. Because remember, one of the ways in which imperialism succeeded so magnificently is to uh, classify itself as a grand, noble enterprise. You know, a civilizing mission, a Christianizing mission, a rescue mission. There are different lovely, lofty names which were given to this entire project of imperialism. But once you are there, in the colonies, once you really see how everything works, it, once you really see the machinery of imperialism, you know this is nothing but crude, naked exploitation. So, you know, and the fact that you are a part of the exploitation, you are the part of this entire uh, machinery of exploitation which is exploiting another race, another set of human beings, uh, doesn't really make you feel good if you're a conscientious person. And obviously, El Orwell over here is a conscientious person. He was confused, but at the same time, he's conscientious. So he knows, he realizes that he is a white male in a non-white space. He also happens to be a police officer. And all that together makes him really, really, uh, you know, 
hatred, makes him really cynical about what he's doing, etc. So secretly, he's saying, theoretically, ideologically, secretly, he was all for the Burmese. So he really was for the Burmese cause of liberation. Right? Because he saw that what's happened to the Burmese is a wrong thing, is a morally wrong thing. Okay? And you know, he was against the oppressors, the English, the British. But the paradox is, he works for the British. Right? So he's someone who is a servant of the British Army, the British Empire. But at the same time, ideologically, he hates uh, imp imperialism. So it's a bit of a catch to the situation, as you can see. Uh, it's a no-win situation. It's a paradoxical situation. He's in a limbo. He can't really choose between one and the other. So at a macro level, at a macro ideological level, he is for the Burmese and he is against the British. You know, he ideologically hates the British. But at a micro level, uh, you know, he's someone uh, you know, who, who hates the Burmese as well because they all hate him back. Now this particular image, uh, the very depressing image of prisoners in caves who are tortured and how he experiences this torture from very close quarters because he happens to be a police officer, you know, a subdivisional police officer over there. Uh, so he sees how people are tortured systematically, uh, corporally, mentally, uh, you know, how they, they are tortured uh, in order to keep the empire running. And that's not a happy side. And, and obviously, he also realizes that he is part of the torture. He is part of the machinery of torture, whether he's doing it directly or not. He can't take his hands off. He can't, he can't wash his hands off. So he's guilty, he's cynical, he's bitter. Okay? And as you can see, uh, the words that come over here are very depressing words. Uh, he has, or he suffers from an intolerable sense of guilt. But I could get nothing into perspective. So he's completely confused. Right? So he's existentially confused, he's politically confused, he's ideologically confused because he hates everyone over there. Uh, I was young and ill-educated. Uh, I, I had, had to think out of my problems in the utter silence that is imposed on every Englishman in the East. So silence imposed on Englishmen on the East. And that silence becomes a metaphor for the lack of agency. You can't speak. Right? So as you can see, there is, as you know, some of you who, who have sort of read post-colonial studies, uh, to some extent, there's a very famous essay by Gato Chopra with his people. It's called Can the Subaltern Speak? Right? And that is about the subaltern people. That is about the people who are tortured. That is about people like these Burmese people, the wretched prisoners who are tortured uh, in uh, prison camps, the women who are doubly marginalized. So the point is can they speak? Do they have a voice? Right? It's very difficult for someone in that position to speak. But the paradox over here that Owen is saying that despite being, uh, you know, Theoretically, the powerful person, uh, you know, technically the powerful person, he too cannot speak. Right? He cannot speak out against the evil of the empire. He can't speak out against the evil of imperialism. He can't say, stop this, don't torture these people, uh, and let's just go back. He can't say it. He has to carry on the work uh, silently, despite knowing fully well. He's completely aware of the fact that what's happening is morally and politically and at a human level, it's an evil thing. But he can't do anything to change it. He can't do anything to intervene. There's no human intervention possible in this kind of a situation. Okay? So the utter silence that is imposed on every Englishman in the East, okay? that is something which is imposed on him. You know, it's something which is given to him. He can't break it. He can't confront it. He can't challenge it. I did not even know that the British Empire is dying. Still less did I know that it is a great deal better than the younger empires that are going to supplant it. So he did not know because he is right in the middle of it. He did not know that the empire is actually dying gradually. So as I mentioned, it's the 1920s and early 30s. And so the empire would die in another 10, 15 years with the Second World War. India would become liberated and Britain would just cease to become an imperial power. But you know, because he's in the middle of it, he's right in the heart of it, he doesn't realize, he doesn't have a, the big picture. Okay, so he doesn't know that the empire is dying gradually, a natural death. All I knew was that I was stuck between my hatred of the empire I served and my rage against the evil-spirited little beasts who tried to make my job impossible. So again, I mean, observe the political incorrectness of this kind of description. He's talking about the Burmese people over here, describing them as little beasts, evil-spirited little beasts. And that's completely racist by modern standards. But obviously, he's not writing in modern standards. So we have to understand the context in which he's writing. So he is someone who's giving you a very honest picture of his existential experience. That is exactly how I'm suffering. Uh, I hate the empire. I think it's an evil thing. It's an ideologically immoral thing. But at the same time, I hate this evil beast around me who hate me because I happen to be a white man. Okay? With one part of my mind, I thought of the British Raj as an unbreakable tyranny. 
as something clamped down in secular, secularum, you know, in ad infinitum, forever, upon the will of prostrate peoples. With another part, I thought that the greatest joy in the world would be to drive a bayonet into a Buddhist priest's guts. Feelings like these are the normal byproducts of imperialism. Ask any Anglo-Indian official if you catch him off duty. So this is a classic example of ambivalence. Uh, on one hand, uh, he wants to you know, get rid of the empire. He thinks of the empire as a tyranny, uh, something which is happening forever, something which is chaining uh, you know, innocent people, weaker people as an immoral evil thing. But uh, another part of him really wants to take a bayonet and kill all the Buddhist people around him because they hate him. Right? So it's a complete dichotomy of uh, you know, emotions. It's a complete break in emotions. You know? So he's cognitively confused. There's a bit of a rupture. Uh, you can always say it's a split personality. And he says, in the end, uh, feelings like these, or ambivalence like these, on the other hand, are the normal byproducts of imperialism. Okay? It's something which happens normally out of imperialism. This is what imperialism does to you. Right? It makes you, uh, on the one hand, hated ideologically. So you hate imperialism ideologically. It's a, it's a horrible thing. It's a, it's a terrible thing ideologically. You know it because you're in the middle of it. But equally, uh, it makes you cynical and bitter and generate. You're forced to develop this visceral hatred against the people around you, the, the colonized people around you, because they collectively hate you. So like I said, it's a cash 22 situation, completely. A classic cash 22 situation. You can't escape it. It's completely inescapable, right? And that's what he means when he says that you know feelings like these are normal byproducts of imperialism. So this neurosis is normal, right? And that's something which this essay entirely tells you in the end. This is a natural, normal kind of experience, being neurotic to, to this extent, to this degree. Okay? So ask any Anglo-Indian official if you catch him off duty. So if you just catch him off duty, uh, if you're drinking with a person, and you know, alcohol becomes a very important metaphor, especially in Burmese days, the novel that I mentioned, which has a very similar kind of a setting, but obviously it's fictional. Uh, though it does draw on Orwell's personal experiences, but it's not as personal or as autobiographical as this particular essay. Uh, Burmese days, uh, you know, you have Burmese days, a very interesting novel where people perform certain kinds of identities in the morning when they go to the offices and talk to the colonized people, uh, when they interact among themselves. They are something. They are civilized, white people, skilled, civilized, efficient people. But when they, when they get drunk, in the evening, when they, when they indulge in alcoholism and they become alcoholics in the end, all of them become alcoholics in the end, that is where they get quote unquote off duty. And that is where you get to know the truth about the experience of being powerful. And that is why they tell you that being powerful actually is an experience of powerlessness. Because if you have to be powerful all the time, if you don't have an option not to be powerful, that is what makes you powerless. So here, gender becomes, uh, hegemonic gender becomes, ironically, uh, also a metaphor for imprisonment. So we saw in the previous couple of lectures when we read Shatan Shikilari and the chess players, how the women were imprisoned because of their gender identity, because they don't have any financial agency, any cultural agency, any political agency, despite their talents. I mean, they, would have been, they would have made much better rulers, administrators, courtiers, uh, military people, if they had a choice, uh, the, the chance, the opportunity. But they did not have that opportunity. Historically, that was denied to them at that given point of time. So, and that was tragic. That was deeply tragic and depressing about the condition, right? But over here, we seem to have a more complex thing. We have a person, a white man, who supposedly enjoys all the power, who has all the power. You know, he is politically powerful, racially powerful, privileged in every sense of the word. But ironically, this privilege makes him powerless. Okay? So he says that if you catch any Anglo-Indian official off duty, when he's not being performative, in other words, uh, when it's non-performative, then ask him about the experience of imperialism. And this is exactly what the person will tell you. That, you know, there's a split. Uh, there's a split in your emotions. There's a division in your emotions. On one hand, you hate imperialism. On the other hand, you hate the Burmese people around you. Because, you know, it's, one is ideological hatred, the other is visceral hatred. Okay? And you're sort of caught between two different kinds of hatred. So it's not a very happy state to be in, in other words. Right. So now we move on to the main event uh, in this particular essay, the event which changes things, changes the very ontology of power, changes the very understanding of identity, the very understanding of gender, politics, race, etc. So you know, you, you grew up in that kind of a culture, you 
continue to consume that kind of a narrative which tells you you're powerful because you're a white person in a colonial space, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you, you sort of internalize it after a point. You internalize that narrative which is around you all the time. But there are certain events which happen, and I use the word event quite philosophically. So these are events which change the course of a narrative. These are events which are ontologically designed in such a way that it change the course of a narrative, they change the way you look at things. So, uh, you know, post the event, your perspective will change, your knowledge of life will change, your look of life will change. So, pre event and post event. So, something happens during that event. There's some kind of an ontological change. There's some kind of a change which happens at a level of knowledge. So, it's also an epistemological change, right? So, your understanding changes, right? Your understanding, your knowledge changes. Uh, through a certain series of events. So, this particular event which happens in this essay, and obviously um, theorizing and philosophizing the notion of event, but it's important that we do it, especially because it's so profound uh, in this particular essay. And this particular event changes this entire idea of gender, gendered identity, and power, especially as a white colonial officer in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a colonized space in Burma. So, what is that event that he's talking about? So, one day, something happened which in a roundabout way was enlightening and he used the word enlightening, uh, you know, just reread the word enlightening and obviously the word enlightening means it, it reveals a certain kind of knowledge, but ironically it's a knowledge of nothingness. It's not the knowledge which elevates them, it's the knowledge which sinks them down as we'll see in the course of this essay. It was a tiny incident in itself, but it gave me a better glimpse than I had had before of the real nature of imperialism the real motives for which despotic governments act. So, the event in itself technically was not a major event, it is a very minor event, but ontologically, epistemologically at the level of knowledge, uh, that is why I use the word epistemological, it is a major profound massive event because it changes everything, right. Uh, it gives them a renewed understanding of life, a renewed understanding of power, of imperialism, how things work, how power works, how identities are created recreated, generated, degenerated and regenerated okay? and that is what happens in this particular essay. Early one morning, uh, the sub inspector at the police station at the other end of the town rang me up on the phone and said that an elephant was ravaging the bazaar. So, you know the word bazaar obviously came from the colonies, so it is one of the like loot like many of the words which came in. So, there was a bazaar and there is an elephant which was ravaging the bazaar, so presumably it is a mad elephant. And so, uh, would I please come and do something about it? I did not know what I could do, but I wanted to see what was happening and I got on the pony and started out. Now, notice over here uh, the automatic expectation from the white man because he happens to be the hegemonic gendered identity. Uh, and I use the word hegemonic in, in a loaded kind of a way because he's hegemonic because of his gender and also because of his race. Because mind you, uh, we just saw a little while ago how European women uh, who are also white, so racially they're privileged, but because you know they have a different gender identity, they're not so privileged, they're not so feared as a white man. So no one would dare uh, spit beetle juice on a white man in the bazaar. But people would do it for fun when a white woman would pass by because there'd be a lesser fear for retaliation. Unless of course there's a male round uh, who can be offended on behalf of the woman and you know avenge uh, the woman and retaliate on behalf of the woman. But the women themselves um, seem to be quite you know powerless uh, you know as uh, human beings themselves. But the point is, oh yeah, there's a mad elephant in the bazaar. There's a, there's a news that the elephant has gone mad in the bazaar. And the obvious automatic immediate expectation is that a white man would come and control it with a gun. Because he happens to be the hegemonic gendered identity. So, he is a military identity, he is the authoritative identity, he is the assertive identity and all that taken together makes him the automatic choice uh, of being the instrument of control, right. So, whenever there is an uh, example of uh, anarchy, it is a white man who is supposed to go and reestablish reason there, right. So, if you look at again, if you are philosophizing the entire thing, if you are looking at this theoretical thing, the, the elephant coming into the bazaar and ravaging it is an example of the break of the normative narrative. That is not what happens every day, right. You, you do not walk into a bazaar and expect the elephant ravaging it every day. You walk into a bazaar and find, you expect it to be you know, normal uh, people coming and buying and selling and consuming things. That is what happens in a bazaar. That is the normal narrative, the normative narrative uh, that we associate with a bazaar. Now, that normative narrative has been disrupted by the appearance of this elephant who was come in, uh, who had come in 
and had gravity bizarre. Now, the moment there's a break or disruption of normativity, the person summoned uh, is the person who embodies normativity, embodies hegemony, embodies establishment, uh, the white man. Right? So the white man is summoned to reestablish reason, to reestablish rationality, to reestablish normativity uh, in the bazaar. So you know, uh, his response is, I did not know what I could do. Because you know, he's a human being. You can't just say, oh, there's a mad elephant in the bazaar. Uh, I'll just go and uh, shoo it away. You, know, you can't say that as a human being. But because he's a white man, he knows there are some expectations of him. So what does he do? I took my rifle, uh, an old .44 Winchester, and much too small to kill an elephant. But I thought the noise might be useful in terror, to create terror, just in case he wants to make a blank fire to uh, scare the elephant away. So he gets in the pony, gets into a rifle, takes a rifle, and uh, heads towards the bazaar in order to find the elephant with the hope of controlling it because it's gone mad. Various Burmans uh, stopped me on the way and told me about the elephant's doings. It was not, of course, a wild elephant, but a tame one which had gone must. It had been chained up as tame elephants uh, always are when the attack of must is due. But on the previous night, it had broken its chain and escaped. Its Mahut, the only person who could manage it when it was in that state, uh, had, been, had set out in pursuit but had taken the wrong direction and was now 12 hours journey away. And in the morning, the elephant had suddenly reappeared in the town. The Burmese population had no weapons and were quite helpless against it. It had already destroyed somebody's bamboo hut, killed a cow, and raided some fruit stalls and devoured the stock. Uh, also, it had made the municipal rubbish van, and when the driver jumped out and took to his heels, had turned the van over and inflicted violences upon it. Okay? So this is the long and short the summary of what the elephant had done. So it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a tame elephant, it's a normal elephant, it's a domestic elephant, but it, is had, it has had an attack the seasonal attack, when elephants become amorous, uh, they become frenzied, and it's that state which has been talked about. In that frenzied state, it's managed to break away from the chains, and you know, it's become wild temporarily. The Mahud, which is all, who's the only person who can control it in this state, had taken a wrong direction, so it's headed the wrong way, so it's 12 hours behind the elephant. So meanwhile, the elephant has come to the town and had done certain things which are you know, uh, quite disturbing. So it's get into a bamboo hut, kill the cow, and raided some fruit stalls and devoured the stock, is eaten up fruits, is you know, rampaged across the bazaar. And, you know, and interestingly, uh, there's a municipal van, rubbish van, which it managed to find, and then it overturned it. The driver ran away, of course, to save his own life, and the elephant just basically uh, and ravished the particular municipal van. So this is a story which is given to Orwell uh, as it set out you know, to shoot the elephant. Now, what we'll see subsequently in this particular essay is how certain events uh, play out, how certain events emerge out of this particular report, and how those, e those events, they you know, existentially problematize the entire location of power. Right? So at this stage, what we have is a very normal description of non-normativity. Right? The elephant had come, a wild elephant, a tame elephant had become wild. So that itself is an example of non-normativity. It's a break of normativity, right? And because it's gone wild temporarily, what it had done is it had come into town, did some damages, uh, eaten up some fruit stalls, overturned some uh, you know, stalls in the bazaar, and then in the middle of the city, middle of the town, it had found uh, you know, this rubbish van which it had overturned, and then it's sort of basically having a good time ravaging it. So this is what the elephant had done, and over the man, over the white police officer, is supposed to go and tame it, control it. Okay? But we'll get to know subsequently, uh, as we read the essay, what happens is a twist of events which make it more complex and which reveal before us, and to Orwell uh, inside this particular essay, uh, the constructedness of gendered identities, especially politically, political gendered identities. So identities which are political as well as gendered coalesce together, as in the case of Orwell, the white police officer in colonial Burma. So I'll stop here today. Thanks for listening, and we'll continue with this particular text in the next lecture. Thank you.